Hello everyone, welcome to Dentist Web. Today, we are going to have a very short lecture on one of the most interesting topic in your first year, that is the development of tongue. This topic can be asked in your DADH papers as well as in your HA papers in terms of your long note. Okay, so, but I let you sure that once you clear this topic, you all guys will love this topic because it is one of my favorite stuff. So without wasting much time, let us begin our lecture. Firstly, the introduction. Tongue develops in relation to the pharyngeal arches, that is the first to fourth pharyngeal arch in the floor of the developing mouth. It develops during the fourth to eight weeks of your development. The medialmost part of the mandibular arches proliferate to form the two lingual swellings. These lingual swellings are partially separated from each other by another swelling that appears in the midline. And this swelling is known as the tubercular impair. I know you are not understanding anything. Wait for a few slides. I will show you the diagram. Then it will be completely clear in your mind. So what I said, it develops during the 4th to 8th week. The medial most part of the mandibular arches proliferate to form two lingual swellings. Now, these lingual swellings are separated by another midline swelling known as tubercular. Okay. Now, see. These are the lingual swellings which are separated by another midline swelling known as tubercular impair. This much is clear, right? This is the first pharyngeal arch, second, third, fourth pharyngeal arches. Now, this point, let me show you clearly. Yes, this point is called foramen cecum. Now, what are the purposes of this path? We'll discuss in our next slides. Moving forward, immediately behind the tubercular empire, the epithelium proliferates to form the down growth, is subsequently marked by a depression called foramen cecum. I have already shown you in the diagram. So, we have the two lingual swellings, a tubercular empire separated by a depression called foramen cecum right these two are the lingual swelling and what is this this is the tubercular impar right Another midline swelling is seen in relation to the medial ends of the second, third, and fourth arches, known as hypobrachial eminence or ocula office. In relation to third, second, third, and fourth arches, we have another swelling called hypobrachial eminence. So, what are the swellings we read? We read lingual swelling, tubercular impar, a depression called foramen cecum, and now we are learning about hypobrachial eminence or the copula of his correct now this hypobrachial eminence what it does it divides itself suppose this is the hypobrachial eminence it divides itself into two parts the first part and the second part this is called the cranial part this is called the caudal part cranial and now this is the caudal part now what is the function cranial part yes Eminence soon uh, shows a subdivision into cranial part and the caudal part. Clear caudal part forms the epiglottis. Hope so you all know what is epiglottis. Moving forward, the anterior two-third is formed by the, please note, our tongue. Suppose this is our tongue. The anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. This is our posterior one-third. P and anterior two third A. One third, two third. Clear? So, this anterior two third is formed by the fusion of tubercular impair with lingual swelling. Don't worry, guys. In, your next, in the next slide, we are showing you the diagram. The two lingual swellings fuses with each other and tubercular impair to form the anterior two-third. This entire portion forms the anterior two-third, okay? Anterior two-third of the tongue is thus derived from the mandibular arch. According to some, the tubercular impart does not make a significant contribution to the tongue. 
The posterior one third is formed from the cranial part of the hypobrachial animals. Now, let me give you a short summarize. Okay, so what we read, the anterior, to, okay, tongue comprises of two parts, the anterior part and the posterior part, right? Anterior part is formed by the fusion of lingual swelling plus tubercular empire. Whereas the posterior part is formed from the cranial part of the hypobrachial eminence, the cranial part, right? This much is clear, right? Next, in this situation, the second arch gets buried, not, requ not required, not required. Turning to our next slide, yes. This is the diagram which I was talking about. Please mark, take screenshots, save it, I don't know, but please mention this, all these diagrams in your answer. And while you learn about the development of tongue, keep this diagram in front of you. You will, trust me, you will understand this topic very easily. See, these are the tubercular empire. This is, uh, sorry, these are the lingual swellings. This is the tubercular empire and this is the foramen cecum. Now this entire part fuses to form the anterior two third. This cranial part forms the posterior to posterior one third and the caudal part, what the caudal part do? We already read the caudal part forms the epiglottis. Yes, here it is mentioned. Caudal part forms the epiglottis. See, after fusion, it somehow looks like this. Clear? It somehow looks like this. So what it shows, it is the anterior two-third of the tongue, it is the posterior one-third of the tongue. Anterior two-third, however, this diagram is somewhere wrong because it will start from this part. Okay, that's much is okay. So anterior two-third and posterior one-third. Anterior two-third formed by the fusion of lingual swelling and tubercular empire. Whereas posterior one third is formed from the cranial parts. This is the cranial part, right? And what is this? This forms epiglottis, that is the caudal part. Clear? Now see, this V-shaped division is called sulcus terminalis, which divides your anterior two third and posterior one third. Sulcus terminalis. Clear? Moving ahead, see what I said, the line of junction of anterior two-third and posterior one-third of tongue is indicated by an inverted V-shaped structure called sulcus terminalis. Next, see here I mentioned the nerves. This is your nerve supply. The anterior two-third of the nerve is supplied by the lingual branch of the mandibular nerve, which is the part of uh, the post-traumatic part of the first arch post-traumatic nerve of the first arch and by caudatic vein, mandibular nerve and caudatic vein, right? Posterior one-third is supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve and the posterior most part is supplied by superior laryngeal nerve, which is the nerve of fourth arch. Clear? So here we are learning three nerves, basically. First is the mandibular nerve. Second is glossopharyngeal nerve. And third is the superior laryngeal nerve, right? Yes. If you don't love to write in description, you can draw this diagram and you can mention the name of the nerves. This diagram is sufficient for an answer of the nerve supply of tongue. See the motor nerve supply and the sensory nerve supply. What the motor nerve supply includes? It includes the paratoglossal nerve, that the cranial root of the accessory via vagus nerve, all the muscles of the tongue except the paratoglossal that is the hypoglossal nerve. Clear? Internal laryngeal nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, lingual nerve, and caudal tympani. This is clear to you all. The component of the tongue includes mucous membrane, muscles, and fibroadialate stroma. The mucus of the tongue is derived from endoderm of the forebrain. Hope so, you know what is fogut, fogut, midgut, and hip. So, the mucus of the tongue is derived from the endoderm of this fogut. Musculature of the tongue is derived from occipital myotome. These are some of the viva questions you can be asked. If you don't mention these points, it's not so important. But please keep in mind, 
whatever diagrams I have shown, I have presented in front of you. Don't forget to mention those diagrams in your answer. The tongue here. What I mentioned, I mentioned in the name of the papillae, the taste buds, which helps to uh, helps us to taste anything. The sulcus terminus, which I've already discussed, glossopharyngeal nerve, I've done, hospital metatoms, it's done. Yes. Last topic for today is the clinical feature or the developmental disturbances of tongue. What are the developmental disturbances? They are the aglossal. Microglossia and macroglossia. So, what are this? Uh, what is aglossia, microglossia, and macroglossia? Macroglossia, as the name says, macro means large. The tongue may be too large than the normal one. It's called macroglossia. The one which is too small is called micro. Uh, I'm sorry, it will be microglossia. And the one where the tongue is absent is called a glossia. So macroglossia number one, microglossia number two, and lastly, where the absent complete absence of tongue, it is called a glossia. Tongue may be bifid, bifid because of the non-fusion of the two lingual swellings. When the two lingual swellings fail to fuse, it is called a bifid tongue. The apical part of the tongue may be anchored to the floor of the mouth by an overdeveloped frenulum. This condition is called ankylostoma. Please highlight this word ankylostoma or tongue type. So what are the things we have read here? The macroglossia, my, uh, what are the things we read here? We read macroglossia, microglossia, aglossia, uh, non-fusion bifid tongue, Ankyloglossia or the tongue type. Occasionally, the tongue may be adherent to the palate. If it, it is adherent to the palate, it is called ankyloglossia superior. Clear? If it is attached to the floor, it is simply called ankyloglossia or tongue type. If it is attached to the palate, it is called ankyloglossia superior. So, the hopes of the anomaly of tongue is clear to you all. So, that's it. Thank you so much, guys. Keep supporting our channel, Dentistry. Till then, keep learning. Thank you.